good to be here this morning. Praise God. Amen. You know, I always tease you, you know, I say, this is where you get to talk back. You know, you, you train your children, and I was trained by my parents, don't talk back. But when we talk about praising the Lord, there is an antiphonal talking back that we do. We say, praise the Lord, and you say, praise the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. It's so good to be with you here today. I bring greetings uh, from my husband, Jeff. He's in Miami right now ministering uh, to some Latin churches and uh, had a men's retreat yesterday with uh, multi-churches that are in the Miami area. And today he's at um, Templo Misionero Betel, and that's Missionary Temple Betel. So um, he sends his greetings to you this morning. We were texting last night about the Syracuse game, Cuse, you know, and uh, not to trivialize here this wonderful sacred place at this pulpit, but we were hopeful that they would win and they did not. But anyway, um, we were texting back and forth with each other and talking about in the middle of that game how it was going in the kingdom. Things are going good in Miami and things are going great where? Here in Philly. And so we bless the Lord this morning for what he's doing and he has done. And of significance to me, precious to be here uh, following Easter. How wonderful. And uh, to be able to sing all those cross-centered songs about the Lord. And it's interesting because the verses that the Lord has given to me this morning that I woke up with, in addition to the text, have all been read or said. Um, and I rejoice in that. So I want us to, to look at the word today in Luke chapter 14. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what it means to be a disciple. And I want to tell you this morning that your discipleship will be tested. Tell your neighbor, hey, look it, your discipleship will be tested. Well, you know, a disciple is someone who is in the receiving mode, a person who is learning, someone who is applying themselves to um, learn or actually um, pattern something from their master. A, a, a disciple is someone who is literally being trained and being schooled to a certain style of living, rule of living, form of life. And so the disciples of Jesus were those who attended to the way, that way being his way. And I want to tell you, and to put it in street terms, straight up, your discipleship is going to be tested. There's no way that you're not a believer of the Lord and not having uh, to encounter tests in your discipleship. In other words, you're going to walk around that people say, well, who are you? You know, you are, you're a religious person or you're a faith-based person or whatever they tell you. Whatever you respond back, you need to understand, and I'm preaching to the choir here, you understand, your walk with the Lord, your relationship with Jesus the principles and rule of living which you live by will be tested. There is no way that you can be a follower of Christ and not discover that there is testing that comes along with that relationship. So reflecting on that, I would like to ask you this. How many of you like taking tests? Oh, Daniel, you would raise your hand. Oh, they raise their hand. You know why they like taking tests? Now, that is a different type of character and a different style of person. That's a person who is so well-versed, trained, and they know that they've studied their subject that to take the test is the proof of what they know, and they rejoice in that. That's a higher level of position of thinking when it comes to tests. But people like me don't always have that position and perspective of what a test means. And so in our mind, you know, when we, we think about taking a test, immediately you revert back in your life to a test that you had to take, which to this day you still need inner healing for. Like for instance, remember the first time you took a driver's test and perchance you weren't ready for that test and you hit the cone or you didn't stop completely at the stop sign and the, the person, the driver, the, dri the, the, the person in 
charge of determining whether you pass or you fail, looks, gives you that look like always with glasses and looks at you like this, and you know it's all over with, and that you're not going to get passed, and you won't get your license, and I remember that lament it happened to me once, and I was so discouraged about it, but I knew I just had to keep after it. And, uh, you know, it's very rare that two of, we have three daughters, two of them failed the first time. The only one that didn't was the later one, and that's because she was 17 by the time she took her test. And so, being 17, I'm sure that the instructor thought, she's been driving a long time, she's got a lot of experience under her belt, she's going to be 18 and going to college, so I better pass this girl, and uh, no doubt that she probably didn't do as well, or uh, probably about the same as her former two siblings, but because she was older. The truth was, though, she was more, she was safer in her approach to driving, you know, I would say, because at 17, you're a little bit more subdued than you are at 15, thinking that you can conquer the world. So do anybody, anybody here need inner healing from their driving? Tests when they were young, you know, about that? Or how about your first college final? What about that? You know, now I can tell you it's not in our human nature to automatically like taking tests. If you had to choose between an exam, where you, one, know the date of the testing, number two, know the material you would be tested on, or a pop quiz, which would you prefer? I think all of us would rather know the date and know the material than those wonderful pop quizzes that your professors put on you every day, or you don't know one day you're going to go in there, they tell you, make sure that you read chapters 15 through 18 by such and such a time. And all of a sudden comes a week, that week, the next week following that date, you're not thinking about it, you show up for class, and boom, there it is, that great pop test. Well, I want to tell you that living as a disciple of Christ is more like a pop quiz than it is a final exam. And this, this whole long course we have to be able to live life every day, knowing that when eternity comes, our life will be measured. And so we do need to count our days and to live in light of the answer that we're going to have to give for our days. I can raise my hand and say, many days I live that I'm not mindful of that at the forefront of my mind. But the older I get, the more aware I am of that final time when I'll stand before the one who created me, stand before the one who died for me, stand before the one who redeemed me, stand before the one who loves me so much so that even after having been redeemed, I still do not pass those pop quizzes from day to day as my life as a disciple following Jesus. I've come to encourage you today and to read in the word of God and to draw some wonderful opportunities of encouragement from this. So in Luke chapter 14, beginning with verse 25, we read, now great multitudes were going along with him. He turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, now who's speaking now? This is not the apostle Paul. This is not Peter. This is Jesus. Jesus speaking. He says, if anyone comes to me, Jesus, and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation, and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and take counsel, whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to enter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks terms of peace. So therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his own possessions. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. Your word is life and it is light. And I pray this morning for us that this word, which is life, 
and light would illuminate our understanding and our minds. I pray right now over the minds of my friends who have come here to worship you today. I pray that you would illuminate their minds with the truth and go beyond that and make its application in their life as only you, Holy Spirit, can do. Because I don't know everything about their lives, but you do. And you know how to encourage them in their discipleship in following you. And so, Lord, we would be encouraged to follow you more diligently and to take up our cross and be able to do that in a way that pleases you and in a way that causes your light in your life to be a reality, not only in our life, but in the lives of those who are all around us, where we work, where we live, where we grocery shop, where we go and see games. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so here we have this analogies, several analogies. We, we read about discipleship, we read about following the Lord, and if we look right here, the first verse in 26, it says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. That first test of discipleship is in the ability of whoever is able to love the Lord more in the sense of loyalty, or who is it that you respect or you love or you fear more? Do you love your family more than you do the Lord? Now, this is very odd because we're called to love everyone, aren't we? And yet here God's word says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, we need to understand what that is talking about. That word hate is miseo in the Greek, and it means to detest, especially to persecute. And it, by extension or figuratively speaking, it means to love less. And so we need to understand that it's not encouraging. Jesus isn't encouraging you to hate your mother and your father and your brothers and your sisters. So, you know, this is how people who don't know the word will use something like this and say, see, you can't read that word. It tells you to hate your father and mother. That's not the meaning here. The meaning is in contrast, write it down to Matthew 10, 37. Matthew 10, 37 where he says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. In John 21, 15, do you remember? Jesus said to Peter after the resurrection, after the resurrection. Remember, they were discouraged. What happened to this great God? Jesus was God. What, where'd he go? He died, he rose again, he was seen of men 40 days, then he had the ascension. And they were a little bit disillusioned as, okay, what's the plan here? Because in their mind, they were thinking of terrestrial kingdoms, as we know in reference. Well, let me build you three temples here. When we saw on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were always looking for Jesus to build a kingdom according to man's ways. But God had a kingdom in mind that was an invisible kingdom, a kingdom not built by stones and wood, hay, and stubble, but a kingdom built by Christ himself. So anyway, Jesus asked Peter after the resurrection, do you love me more than these? Now in that context, what was he referring to? The fish. How many of you eat fish here? How many of you like the fish? How many guys do we like to fish here? So, you know, anybody who likes fish, or maybe you like to golf, or maybe you like to do fowl, you know, like there's that wild program called Duck Dynasty where those guys with those long beards and those ducks, I mean, it is wild out there, but their thing is ducks. Peter's thing was fish. So Jesus said, do you love me more than these? He was referring to the fish. And he said, of course I love you more than these. So the scripture says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brother and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he can't be my disciple. That really is a comparative. And it's a comparison between how much we love the Lord and how much we love our own families. I mean, honestly, fathers, how much do you love your children? Moms, 
What would you do for your, for your children, your grandchildren? Wives, what would you do for your husbands? You love them that much. Husbands, what would you do for your wives? You love them that much. But see, the Lord was trying to say, there is a love for me that should be supersede your love for one another. Now, my son-in-law has married our oldest daughter, and they have given us two beautiful grandchildren. And when my son-in-law decided to ask for my daughter's hand in marriage, he did this wonderful thing. And I thank the Lord because it was my first time, our first time, giving our blessing to one of our children in marriage. He first asked my husband, and then he came to the house and he asked me. He asked me for my daughter's hand, and then he asked us again for her hand in marriage. I thought that's a pretty good idea, actually. I think that's a pretty good thing. You know somebody's serious and honorable when they do it that way. And one of the questions I had for him, because I knew he was coming, I said, Lord, what do you want me to say to him? I never thought that I would be asked. I knew that Jeff would formally be asked, and of course we would give our blessing if he's the right one. What, would I, what do I say to this son-in-law? And quickly the Lord gave me some things to say, Okay, answer this for me. So I asked him, I have a very important question, really important question. If you can answer this question and you answer it correctly, it will really determine whether I give you my blessing to marry my daughter. He said, okay, Mama Clark. And I said, wow, I'm being called Mama already. That's pretty much something. I said, do you love Jenna more than you love God? And he looked at me and he smiled and his eyes filled with water. He said, you know, I'm going to tell you, again, using street terms, straight up. He said, three months ago, I would have told you, I love your daughter more than anything. He said, but after these three months of my relationship with the Lord, something has happened. And he says, it would kill me to live without Jenna, but I could never live without my Jesus. I said, oh, you answered right. I said, because you know what? After you get married, I know you love my daughter, but the realities of life and living, you're going to need something more than love, and you're going to need something supernatural, and that's why no man or woman is able to love each other the way they deserve without having God helping that spouse love that, that other spouse the way they need to be loved. I said, so when your love wanes thin because of familiarity, financial leanness, or troubles, it's going to be the love of God that's going to bolster you up, and you're going to be able to love my daughter in the way that she deserves to be loved because Jesus is loving through you, you see. So when he said, talks about discipleship, he says, if anyone comes to me, and does not hate, again, that means you have to have a preference that Christ is above everything else. So this morning, I ask you, does that reality ring true in your life? Are you able to say that you love the Lord more than your spouse, that you love the Lord more than um, your children, that you love the more Lord more than your grandchildren, that you love the Lord more than your Mercedes, I don't think that applies here. Or you love the Lord more than whatever thing it is that you like, you know. God is not willing to allow that aspect of our spirit to be given to something else. That adoration belongs to him. In Genesis chapter 22, we see an Old Testament pattern of a forthcoming um, actuality and foretelling of what would happen with Christ. It was when God said to Abraham, go and sacrifice your son Isaac. Do you remember that? And it was an amazing thing that happened there in Genesis 22. We find that he went and he presented Isaac. And then in verse 12, the Lord at the time when he was about to sacrifice his son. And this is bizarre to us. But in those times before Christ, they had to have sacrifices. But the sacrifices were animals. And there was a shedding of blood. And that shedding of blood was a foretelling of the shedding of blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which we celebrate in communion. It was a foreshadowing and a prophetic telling of what was to come. That there would be, as was read this morning already in Romans chapter 6, 
one sacrifice, one time for every man and woman who confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We were buried with him. We died with him and now we're resurrected with him and we are alive forevermore. God's word says in Ecclesiastes that he set eternity in men's hearts and they didn't even know it. Once Christ comes into us, eternity has already begun. I'm sorry. I'm not waiting for the sweet by and by in the golden streets or my aunts and uncles and my grandparents and all those who went before me to start celebrating eternity. I am an eternal being already celebrating an eternal life with an eternal God who is, was, and shall be forever and ever and ever. So this thing of discipleship, do you love the Lord more? You're being given a quiz this morning. A pop quiz. Do you love him more? Matthew 10, 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. The offering up of Isaac was a foretelling of what God himself would offer up. And the word of God reflects there in chapter uh, 22, verse 12. But because I know that you fear me, and some translations say, because you love me more than your son. And then it's even made more specific with a predicate nominative saying, your only son. Because you love me, this firstborn only son, this son that you have, this son, you love me more than him. this son you have. Because you love me. Because you love me, you do not have to sacrifice. And there the scripture records that when they went to that Mount Moriah, it said that Abraham, he saw far off. And Hebrews tells us that he actually saw the cross of Christ. That God would provide a sacrifice once and for all. So being his disciple means that he's mine and I'm his. He's the lover of my soul. And when it comes down to it, I'm not giving him up. I will not give him up. And so the Lord asks you today in this pop quiz of discipleship, your discipleship will be tested. Has it been tested? What is it that you've set your heart on? Is your heart set on the Lord? Is your heart set on a person? Is your heart set on a job? Is it set on money? It is it set? What is it set on? Because God is looking for disciples whose hearts and minds and eyes are fixed on him and him alone. Isn't that wonderful? Now, you know, don't look bad at God that he requires this. Would you not expect your wife or your husband to only have eyes for you? Where do you think we got that from? We received that from God. We were made in the image of God. We don't want our spouses loving someone else. We want them to have eyes, hearts, mind, spirit for us alone. Well, you know, John 4 says that the Father is looking for worshipers, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We know that God is spirit, so it's not a fleshly thing, but it's a real thing. God is testing your discipleship. Make sure that he is first in your heart, that you love him more than anything else. And even his word says more than life itself, because it says, yes, even his own life. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother again, that means not literally that you must hate them, but that you must basically put them in a priority of categorization, that you haven't exalted them in your life above the love that you have for the Lord. And then it says, even if you don't put aside your own self, how many of you know it's hard to put away self? You wake up with self every morning, self wants to eat, self wants this, self wants that, self wants the other thing. But you know what? The Lord has made a way for us through his cross that we can deal with ourselves. Then it says here, okay, so we have that first priority. It's a priority of loyalty. 
is your loyalty or is your love? These tests come to us randomly every day. They interrupt every day. When the person cuts you off in front of you and almost makes you crash into the guardrail, you have to decide in that moment, do you love the Lord more than you love your own anger in the moment? Are words of blessing and thoughts of blessings going to come out of you? Or are reactionary things that don't edify the disciple of Christ in you? And I mean, it's the real deal. We live in this real world, right? How about when you go out to your car and there's a ticket on it? I mean, you know, the way that we have to respond to that. There are so many pop quizzes in our lives that will test your discipleship. Don't think when you receive a test that that means that you're not accomplished as a servant of God. It's just simply a part of living in this world. But God's always paying attention to how you react. You know, in Genesis 22, the ver first verse of 22 says that God tested Abraham. He tested him. He put him to the test. He wanted to check out, okay, where's your love level with me? Is it first? Or now that you and Sarah, after almost 100 years, really, have finally have a son, the one I promised, do you still love me? Are you so happy with this boy that he's become everything to you and you don't fear me and love me the way you did before I gave you this wonderful thing called the son? So this pop quiz of God. Checking out our discipleship is going to happen every single day of your life. Every day. Don't be offended when it happens. Just understand that it's part of living in this world, but it's also part of Father watching and saying, okay, you're mine, right? So let's see that. Let's see. And every day, may he give us the grace to more than pass the pop quizzes of our discipleship. But may we excel in truly being his, even when provoked in the most severest of ways. Whoever does not love me more than these cannot be my disciple. Then we come to the next illustration that he gives. First, it talks about hating or loving me more. In, in a matter of measurement. Then it says, whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now that's very interesting when we talk about that thing of carrying our own cross. Um, in the Roman time, the way that they would deal with capital punishment was a cross. During the time of Constantine and the Christian Crusades, the cross were, was abolished as a use of measure for killing people as capital punishment. But this was introduced to the Jews by the Romans in putting people instead of today, they get the electric chair or they get the, the, uh, the um, actual injection with um, some type of, you know, drug that will kill a person. And that is their judgment, usually against a capital crime such as murder. And uh, so the rule of judgment in that day was a cross. And so God's word says here regarding discipleship that whoever doesn't carry his own cross, pick it up every day and come after me, is not worthy to be my disciple. So we have this interesting analogy. If Jesus paid it all, and we read in Romans chapter 6 already, that he's the one who died for us. He's the one who carried his own cross. What does it mean that I have to go out and get you know, these two by fours or two by sixes or four by fours and make a cross and walk around carrying it. How many of you have seen the man who carries a cross all the way around the world? I forget his name. Yes, blessed, Arthur blessed. He takes that cross and he walks with that cross and carries it. You know, on one hand, that's a great example. But on another hand, I also think sometimes we can be mindful of works and carrying crosses. But the reality is, is again, it's a figurative speech. It's figuratively saying the burdens of your every day and life and how you live, if you can't pick up in the middle of your burdens and still follow the Lord, 
in the middle of following him in the higher way, that you, you would be encouraged to pick up that cross every day. See, the, the, the test is going to come to your discipleship. Are you picking it up? Now, when we look at this in Matthew 27, 32, when Jesus was carrying his cross and he was coming out from the accusations and the judgment and the scourging, because in Roman time, they were also scourged and that he was beat with the cat of nine tails, he was whipped and flogged, and just the skin ripped right off of him. How many of you seen the movie The Passion, uh, Mel Gibson's movie The Passion, where you see that that happened? That was part of, they had to be scourged and whipped like that before they were put up on the cross as a capital punishment, all right? And so here in this passage of scripture, Jesus is coming out from the court of having been judged as being crucified. They called for Barabbas, a horrible criminal, and they said, give us him instead of Jesus. And so he's the one who basically got a, a pardon. He was pardoned. He was destined to be executed just like Christ was, but he got a pass and didn't go to death. And instead, the people said, crucify him, crucify him. Even you remember Pilate said, listen, I'm washing my hands of this. This man is innocent. Here you're going to, you, you, you don't want, I, I have no part in this. But he still did. He should have listened to his wife. She had the dream. Don't do anything with this man. He's an innocent man. But he still, he, he still had something to do with it. And I'm not condemning him because I believe if we lived in that time without the revelation of Jesus and not being one of his disciples like John who stood with him in the court right beside him, he was not ashamed to be identified with Jesus even in his judgment, unlike Peter in the moment, who would not be identified with Jesus in his judgment. John was. Peter, oh, I don't know him. I don't know him. But isn't it wonderful how God redeemed Peter's life when he was given his pop quiz? He failed. He failed. The cock won't, won't crow before you deny me. He failed three times, three pop quizzes, and he failed. But isn't the Lord wonderful? He was given another opportunity. He did not fail that time. We find him preaching in Acts, explaining who this Jesus was, explaining what was happening in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when they were gathered together, 120, and they were filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was Petey. Yeah, the one that said, oh, I don't know him. No, I wasn't with him. No, he's not mine. No, he's not from my group. No, you know, denied him, denied him. Three times he failed his pop quiz. But Jesus redeemed him at the shore over those fish. He said, do you love these more than me? He said, oh, no. He said, if, if do you love me? Yes, I love you. Take care of my lambs. Do you love me? You know I love you. A little bit irritated. Tend my sheep. Did Petey tend his sheep? Did Apostle Peter build his church? Yeah. But he failed three pop quizzes in his discipleship. But yet God restored him. I tell you that today. Pete had to learn how to take up his cross and follow Jesus. We find in Matthew 27, 32, this is speaking about the Lord coming out of this judgment place. And as they were coming out, they found a man, Cyrene, named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear the cross. This was Paul who said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ, I die daily. Now, you're not going to go out there and build the cross. How many of you got your crosses erected out there? Come on, talk back. You're going home, you men, you've got your projects in the garage or in the basement. Are you building your own cross? No, it's not about a natural physical cross. It's about a spiritual cross that every day we have to encounter. The crosses that we have to take up every day. God's word says that when Jesus, because he had been beaten and whipped with a cat of nine tails, his flesh literally falling off of him. He was overcome with grief and pain. He was not able to bear that cross. And they grabbed Simon of Cyrene to carry the cross of Christ. I'm here to tell you the reverse has happened for us. You don't have to bear your crosses alone. Jesus, the Nazarite, he comes and steps in by virtue of his resurrection and life. And he helps you bear up his cross. You don't have to carry that cross alone. When it gets testy with your boss at 
work and you don't like your coworkers' attitudes and you're tired of listening to people disrespect you and give you a hard time, you can think of Jesus who was mocked and flogged and you say, and he's right there with you inside of you, carrying up and bearing up that cross when you say again, borrowing from street language, you're putting me on my last nerve right here. You are able to say, Lord Jesus, you are carrying my cross, and I'm taking it up daily with you, and I'm able to follow you. You see, the Lord can put up with your shortcomings. He can, but he can't put up with a disciple who's determined not to do the right thing. A disciple must be focused on more than passing the quiz the pop tests of life. A disciple must choose to have this condition and position in his mind. I am not going to be tooled by life's pop quizzes. I'm going to be schooled by them. And I'm going to rise as a conqueror in resurrection life, having the mind of Christ and the character of Jesus. Somebody comes and says something to you. You don't want to say, bring it, bring it. You want a piece of me? Again, borrowing from street language. No, you want to be able to look at them and smile and say, you're having a hard day, I'm praying for you. My husband, he determines any time he runs into a prude or a prune or a sour grape, he determines that thing is going to be sweet before I leave here. And my husband will look at them. They can be the grumpiest, sourest, nastiest person, whether they're at the bank, at the grocery store, at the gas station, wherever they are, they start giving him that awful attitude. He just, I'm like, oh Lord. And when I'm with him, I know it means it's going to take longer to get back to the car or where we are because my husband is working on that cross and taking it up and being a blessing. And so somebody will say, what do you want like that? He'll say, I'm sorry. Are you, what happened today? It's been hard, right? Most of the time, if they're really grumpy, they look at him like, you know, be quiet. I don't need you in my business, you know, give him that kind of attitude. But they don't know what to say. So they're quiet. He goes, I know it. He said, it can be rough. Then before you know it, they're telling him whatever the problem is. And then before you know it, it's turned into a counseling session. And, and, and I've had to take up my cross when he decides to do that. <laughs> When I'm hungry or the kids are in the car, whatever it is, you know. But I have learned to do the same thing. See, these pop quizzes come to you, but don't beat up on yourself that you're getting a pop quiz because that's what we do. That's what the devil does to us. And says, see, if you already graduated, you wouldn't need a pop quiz. So you must not be a good believer because you keep getting these tests all the time. It's part of being a disciple. It's part of living in this world. We're going to get these pop quizzes that will challenge your faith, challenge your character, challenge your Christian style of living, challenge your attitude. The other day, just yesterday, Friday, excuse me, I had mine challenged. I had a big pop quiz. By the end of it, I said, I didn't pass this. I did the right thing. I did the right thing. But in my heart, I was not liking doing the right thing. And I said to the Lord, I will not receive any blessing from you just because I did the right thing. Because in my heart, I didn't want to do the right thing. You say, Sister Nancy, you didn't want to do the right thing. Well, I really want to always do the right thing. But sometimes you're challenged to the very nitty gritty of your soul, particularly in places that you've made it clear how something is. And right at that place where there has been an understanding between you and a situation of where you are, Satan comes and he pushes the line back on you a little bit. And your flesh does not like that. You see, the thing that I'm learning as I'm being schooled by the Holy Spirit by being tooled by the world to be an instrument of God's grace is that flesh screams. Spirit is just at peace and is usually silent. So when I'm in that place of reaction, I know my flesh is alive. 
But when I'm at a place of peace and come to a place of, okay, Lord, this is not right, but nevertheless, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be your disciple. I'm going to take up this cross. This word cross is staros in the Greek. It's an instrument of capital punishment. It literally means figuratively exposure to death. And then to take it a little bit further, it means self-denial. So how many times do we have to deny ourselves? We have to deny ourselves every day. Colossians 3, 5 says, to put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Okay, we know what belongs to our earthly natures. Let's talk 21st century language, sexual immorality. Number one, that doesn't just mean going out there and doing the dirty. It means what you look at, what you read, and what you think. Are we still together? Are we all right? Sexual immorality is something that God touches because it's according, sexual immorality in, involves, it is the most committed form of physical sin that you can have. Physical sin. I mean, along with other things like murder, when you act in violence against another creation of God. And so he says, put to death those things, our earthly nature. How many of you know what your earthly nature is? No hands. Okay, let's ask the people that know you. How many of you know what your neighbor's earthly nature is? <laughs> we are familiar with one another. We can tell the truth on each other. Oh, yeah, I saw you get, and don't we use the word, testy. Yes, we get testy when God gives us these little pop quiz tests of life to see how good you are. How good is your salt? How good is your worship of God? How are you going to do when your children are screaming one more time and waking you up at three in the morning and you haven't slept in three weeks and all you're looking for is a night of sleep? How sweet are you going to be when after the 20th time you've said, please don't put this here because I'm going to end up tripping over it. And it gets put there again and you trip over it again and again and again. See, those things in life and living out our life, that's why we need the Spirit of God to help us to be led by the Spirit. Impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. See, that's what this whole thing started out with. He who doesn't hate his father and mother. In other words, God says, you know what? I love you so much. I gave everything for you. And I'm not willing to share you with anybody. I paid the ultimate price. And I expect you to do the same. Right? As a wife, I expect my husband's fidelity. My husband expects mine. That's fair. It's not only fair, it's just. It's not only just, it's right. It's not only right, it is the way to be sweet and in love. There's no other way. But when you've got faithfulness at the core and righteousness at the core of your discipleship, then every pop quiz you have, you will more than pass. You will get a hundred on. Because the Spirit of God in you rises to the occasion to usurp and put to death your flesh every time. I've had to do that this past week in amazing ways. Put to death the works of the flesh. Put to death. You know one of the things that we have to put to death? Self-justification. Well, that wasn't right. You know, I didn't deserve that. That's even wrong to do, you know? God's word says don't do that. But guess what? It still gets done to you. How do you respond? We don't always respond initially the right way. But this is what's so sweet about God. Did you ever have a teacher who, after you failed a pop test, gave you back the pop test and said, now I'm going to give you this pop test again after a week of being taught? And you get to take the same pop test again, literally after review of the same material, and you pass it, and they tell you, I will give you 20% more of what you get right than what you did initially. Isn't that the way God's mercy works? But God's mercy is even far more extreme than that. God says, I'm going to give you a hundred because I 
I am the one who causes you to excel in the tests of life. I am the one that says, okay, I see your effort. Okay, I see you toiling and rowing. I see you struggling in your relationships. I see you struggling in your jobs. I see you struggling. I'm coming to you there because you're my disciple. But you take up that cross now. I'm going to help you. And he comes and he carries our cross for us. Just like Simon the Cyrene carried it for Jesus in the physical day, we have a Savior. We have a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit, three persons in one who are helping us every day carry our crosses and follow him. Then he gives an expression of what this means, and it's very interesting. And this is why it's so important to read the word and to understand it and study it and not just read it and say, hey, yo, that didn't make sense. How many of you have, have read the word and said, that didn't make sense? Come on, am I the only one? No. Tell the truth now. We've all read the word and said, Lord, you look like you're contradicting yourself there. What does that mean? Yeah. You know? And so you have to study it to see what it means. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. Now, when you go to put together some kind of stool or chair, or you've been given a new TV and a new remote control. There is a language about those remote controls. You've got to get the manual out, and you've got to understand how to operate that remote control. I tried to operate the remote control in the room I was last night just to see if Syracuse was winning or not. I couldn't figure it out to save my life. I put the thing down. I said, okay, Lord. I started texting my husband. What is the score? I know how to operate my cell phone and my text messages. I didn't know how to operate the remote control. We need to understand what God is doing in his word to teach us how to operate and what it means. So he gives this expression and this analogy about carrying your cross, and he compares it to this. For which one of you, when he wants to build the tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he is enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him. So what the Lord is saying here, Jesus is speaking, listen, it's going to cost you to follow me. you got to take up your cross and follow me. I will have you prioritizing your life in a way that I'm first. got to put me first above all your family members and your family. Second of all, I'm going to tell you, you have to put me above your, even your own self because I'm putting myself above you. And so then he goes on, you know, this thing of discipleship, it's going to cost. If you wanted to be a member of a club, a workout club, and you want to be a member of that, does it cost you anything to go to that gym and work out? Does it cost you? You understand what it means, but we're a member of the kingdom of heaven. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and there is a cost. Jesus paid the cost, but we have to, every time we go to get in that gym, when you pay the cross, what do you do? You show a card that your cost has been paid for. Our card is Christ Jesus. And so every time we get put in the test of somebody to tell us that we can't go there, we can't live there, we can't do this, or you can't do that, we have to remember to whom we belong, that he paid for us a way and made a way. And so I can come to the test of my life and say, I got the master of masters schooling me. And you try to tool me, oh world, with your pop quizzes, but every time you to me, I'm going to school you because you are going to become the master by which I am perfected in Christ. I am not going to be your slave. Come on, church. Get excited that we got an advantage. You don't need cheat notes. Hello? You've got Jesus. You've got the word of God. So he compares this cost of discipleship and he says, it's like a carpenter. It's like a foreman. It's like a builder who looks and says, I'm going to build an apartment complex. I know what this was like. I remember when I was only 23 years of age, we lived in Wide Awake, Wiley, Texas. And my husband and I were teaching at Bible schools, and we were pastors on staff. And it was during the time of the great oil flow. Remember? All the oil and the money in the oil in Texas was just flourishing everywhere. And there was a builder 
Unger, who decided to build this great, huge estates of these fancy, fandangled apartment complexes. And they had great fountains and all kinds of architectural work around. They were the fanciest apartment places I had ever seen. And they were going up, and they had the chipboard up there. And all of a sudden, winter set in, and all of the buildings stopped. And they didn't turn off the plumbing, and the particular builder, his oil ran dry. And he had no more money to build his apartment complexes. So here we are. It was one of these rare times when in Texas, it was 30, 28 degrees, 30 degrees. So you know what happened? All of the pipes burst. And the fountains with the water froze like big ice sculptures all over the place. And we would drive by and look at those ice sculptures and wonder what happened. What happened is he did not determine the cost. He did not know that he was going to run out of money. Every time my husband, throughout his life in tent making, as Paul did, he goes and he makes a bid. And he tells the person that he's building for, this is what the material is needed. This is what the cost is going to be of material. This is what the cost is going to be of labor. I just saw this, and I rejoiced in my heart when the Lord spoke to me this word. I just looked at my, one of my husband's bid for a, a fellow elder on his roof that's leaking. So my husband gave him the bid of what the plywood's going to cost, what the bid of the sheathing's going to cost, the bid of the, the black paper, tar paper, the nails and the, the uh, the shingles, the whole nine yards, and he has to initial it and sign there. You see, this thing about serving Jesus, listen to me. Don't be a Christian who doesn't understand it's going to cost you. Be an intelligent person and understand there's going to be a, a, a cost. How sad will it be in the middle of your trial or pop quiz of life or final that all of a sudden in the middle of you trying to do the right thing at work, somebody spreads rumors about you and says lies about you and the next promotion doesn't come to you. It comes to the one who spread lies about you. In that moment, you want to walk away and have nothing to do with that job, nothing to do with anything. And you want to say, see what I get for following you, Lord? Where is the blessings of following you? Did he promise you life perfect? Did he promise you that you were going to have easy street here in Philadelphia? No, he said, in this world, you will have what? Tribulation. You know why? Because in this world are people, and people trouble you. They give you tribulation. It's not the animals. It's people. There's a retreat center, a Methodist retreat center near our home, a home we have in Painted Post, New York, and our daughter and son-in-law and grandchildren live there. And there's a road, it's called Golf Road, G-U-L-F. And for years when we used to live there, some 18 so years ago, I would walk up and down that road, I would run the road, I would jog the road, and there would be people from New York City, they would come from the urban centers to this retreat center, and they'd be walking the road like this. And one day, this woman, she was literally doing like this. And I'm jogging down the road. And she goes, oh, I'm so glad to see you. She goes, are there bear here? I said, probably. Really? And I said, yeah. She goes, oh. She goes, how about lions? I said, no, we don't have any lions here. She goes, oh. She goes, man, I don't know if I want to rock this road. I said, where are you from? What borough are you from in New York? And she goes, how do you know I was from New York City, you know? I said, oh, I just figured out. I knew, you know? She said, I, and she goes, I said, what borough? I used to live in the Bronx. She goes, you lived in the Bronx? I said, yeah, on Hoa Avenue. Oh, I know where Hoa Avenue is. I said, yeah, I was hit by a car there in the Bronx. She goes, really? And I said, yeah, you see, there was no bears in the Bronx. She goes, oh, no, we don't have bears in the Bronx. I said, 
I said, but I got hit by a car in the Bronx, and there was no bear driving that car. She laughed. She goes, you are so funny. I said, are you hearing what I'm saying? It's the people that you have to be worried about. Those animals, they hear you, they're going to run away. People, when they have their plans and devices, they don't run away. They bump you on the head. They run you over. They mug you. They do all this. I said, that's what you got to worry about. I said, here, you're with God in his creation. You are safe. And she looked at me. She goes, really? I said, yeah. I said, you're crouching around here like something's going to get you. I can walk around the block where you live and something will get me. <laughs> we laughed, we laughed, we laughed. We're going to have those situations. And you know, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to take lightly the struggles. You might be struggling with cancer. You might be struggling with an unfaithful spouse. I'm not trying to trivialize those things. I'm only trying to cheer you on to remember that these quizzes come in our life. And yet, you got to count the cost. It would be a shame for you to have lived your life as such a great disciple and all of a sudden for you to quit just simply because you look at what you've built and you're not happy with it and you don't want to pay the cost of what's coming next. The other analogy that's given here in the word of God is what, arm, what general, what general who, who, who wants a king who sets out to meet another king in battle, he doesn't first sit down and take counsel whether he's strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000. I think that's very important, and that part of this parable is not spoken much about. But I've got to tell you, pay attention to that, because God's word says clearly to us in Proverbs 28, prepare plans by consultation and make war by wise guidance. See, this word right here, when you've heard many times the famous 20th century and 21st century expression, word up, there's a reason for that. Because that is the counsel that God gives you. He gives you counsel by his word. He also gives you counsel by his gifts to the body. Apostle, prophet, pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. He gives you those gifts. He also gives you the Holy Spirit to lead you and to help you be able to endure those pop tests and overcome those pop tests because we are going to be the disciples that finish, not the disciples that quit just because you don't like taking pop quizzes. They're going to come, but learn to allow them not to tool you in the sense of overcoming you, but allow those things to tool you so you can school the world to know a risen Savior. God says here in his word, or else while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. We cannot make peace with the enemy of our soul. We cannot make peace with coke. We cannot make peace with hash. We cannot make peace with pornography, we cannot make peace with anger and rage and child abuse. We cannot make peace with violence. We cannot make peace with injustice. We cannot make peace with terrorism. We cannot make peace with those things. We can make peace with God. And we make peace with God through Christ Jesus. Where are you in your discipleship? Are you allowing him to pay the cost for you? Just fess it up. Just tell him straight up. I don't like this. I'm not doing this very well. I confess that to him almost every other day. Created me a clean heart. Psalm 51, renew a right spirit in me. Give me a right perspective. Help me to keep you first. Because you see, when it gets down to it, it's whoever does not love him more and whoever does not take up his cross and whoever does not count the cost and whoever does not seek counsel and whoever does not give up or surrender, those are the ones that are not his disciples. But we... We are not of those who shrink back. We are those who overcome by the word of the lamb and by the word of his testimony. That's how we overcome every day. The scripture says here, so therefore, no one of you can be my disciple who does not give up. Now here when it says all his possessions, does that mean 
that you can't have a possession, don't get hung up on that. Do you know David had lots of gold? King David had lots of, of land and territory and cattle and sheep. It is not a wrong thing to have things. It's where you put the things in your heart and your mind that determine whether it's wrong to have those things. Many, it's not wrong to have money. It's not wrong to have good things. It's not wrong to have a Cadillac, but it is wrong when your heart is set on those things above the world, above the Lord, and above what matters to him. You see, it's the perspective and the positioning of your heart as a disciple that really determines whether you are a disciple of Christ. I encourage you today, let Jesus help you take up your cross every day with every disappointment, with every struggle, because as being a, a, a member of the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, you've got to be able to count the cost. I'm not going to be a disciple that's half-baked. Finish, and finish well. And let the finisher and the completer of your faith, the one who was originally the author, let him finish in your life things that he has begun in you. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you today for your word. Your word is life eternal. And Lord, right now, I pray, even over my brothers and sisters, in the areas of struggle, Lord, don't let them be tooled by the world, but let the world be a tool of schooling in their life so that we, Lord, together can be more like you. Father, forgive us where, we, we, where we've put our affections on things in this earth. You tell us, don't set your heart on the things of this earth, but put your affections on eternal things. Lord, I, I, I pray for my friends, for my brothers and sisters here, that you would help each and every one understand the calling of discipleship is great. If you want to be a pro athlete, the training of that is ridiculous. It is so costly. If you want to be a professional model or a professional builder or a professional lawyer, the studying and the things that you have to do that, Lord, we would be your disciples. We would, we would have our priorities right. Our loyalty is to you first. We are one of those whoever will love me more than these. We are one of those whoever takes up his cross and denies himself. We are one of those whoever's. We are one of those whoever who counts the cost. We are one of those whoever's, Lord, that surrenders all of our possessions to you. It doesn't mean that we have to put an auction over our home and our cars and our lands and our bank accounts to have some sign of serving you. But Lord, in our heart, where you see alone, man looks at the outward side, but you look in the inward parts. You know what we're putting above you. Father, help us to keep our priorities straight and help us to be true disciples that are not determined by what we dress and what we drive or where we live, but how we walk out our discipleship every day with our families, with our colleagues, with our neighbors, and with our fellow believers. We bless you this morning and thank you that we don't have to carry this burden alone, but you gave us counsel in the word of God. You gave us counsel in the gifts of the body of Christ. You gave us counsel even sometimes it's our own children that speak to us the counsel from on high. More than anything, your precious Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, person of God, you guide us and you lead us in the way of truth and help us to be disciples who finish and don't quit. Father, I pray that you would help every husband, every father, every wife, every mother, every child, every sibling. I pray that you would give every person in this place a greater capacity to finish the pop quizzes of their discipleship to where they will overcome by the grace that you give we're alive in you. Death has no more place in us. Lord, sometimes it's not about the temptations that come before us. It's the sin that's committed against us. And so even in that place where sin has been committed against your servants here, help them to rise in life and not 
license themselves to quit as your disciple. Thank you that pop quizzes are not to destroy us, but they're to help us become masters in this life of following you. In Jesus' name, amen.